a dog may lessen just not bothering to plan? That's a question for teflologists. When I read this book, is it better to skim or scan? That's a question for teflologists. Can you be a good teacher if you have a Celta, or should you invest in an MA or a Delta? From politics to methodology, we'll discuss them all on Tephalology. Hi, I'm Matthew. I'm Rob. And I'm Matt. And welcome back to Tephalology, a podcast about teaching English as a foreign language and related matters. Brought to you by three self-certified Tephalologists. A term we made up two weeks ago. Tefl News. Okay, and in this week's Tefl News, uh, we're going to be talking about Stephen Bax and his decoding, or his alleged decoding, of the Voynich Manuscript. Uh, so, do you guys know who Stephen Bax is? No. Yes, I do. Yeah. Can you tell <coughs> us who he is? Well, in I mean, in the, I guess in the Tefl related field, he's. Um, a uh, call expert. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, he's mainly known for call. He also writes about discourse a lot as well. And I think he works at the University of Bedfordshire. Yeah, all so. of that information is correct. Thanks. Well done. Great. <laughs> um, so uh, Stephen Bax has claimed uh, to, down, to, uh, to have decoded the Voynich manuscript. And for those who don't know, um, this is a mysterious manuscript written right. in a language which uh, has never been deciphered. Um, It was discovered in 1912 by a bookseller called Voynich. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't know his first name, probably Simon Voynich. Um, And uh, the the manuscript has been carbon dated to the 15th century. Uh, No one knows who wrote it. No one really knows what it's about, although it appears to be a herbal, which is a book uh, describing plants and the properties of plants uh, for use in medicine and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, No one's been able to make out what any of the words in it mean, what any of the symbols mean, what sounds they signify or anything like that. Um, and there have been a lot of theories about it. So um, in Stephen Bax's paper, he says, a considerable number of theories have been advanced since 1912, including the notion that it is a medical book written in Aztec Nahuatl. Mm-hmm. I don't know how to pronounce that word. Yeah, that was right. Uh, OK, <laughs> thanks. Uh, <laughs> or a 16th century hygiene manual written in left, right, mirrored, middle high German. <laughs> or a recipe book in Old Latin, or a work by a juvenile D- uh, Leonardo da Vinci. Wow. Um, mm. But because no one's been able to figure out what it means, uh, a lot of people have just written it off as a hoax. Until now. Until now, no. possibly. So Voynich was a bookseller. He discovered it in his bookshop? Well, in someone else's bookshop, and then he bought it, and then he owned it. After I that. see. Yeah. More of a... <laughs> <laughs> a book buyer. Yeah. So yeah. it's not the Voynich, it's Voynich's... Manuscript. Well, no, it's called it's called the Voynich manuscript. It, yeah. But he just he just bought it. He doesn't own it anymore. Now someone else owns it. Oh. Yeah. But he's dead as well, isn't he? He is. Yes. Because right. he found <laughs> it in 1912. Um, but yeah. So Stephen okay. Bax has see, yeah. Uh, yeah Stephen Bax has um, come up with what he thinks is a new way of trying to decode the manuscript. So in the past, people have used these kind of top-down approaches, trying to yeah. do statistical analysis on mm. symbols mm. in the text. Um, he's focused on a bottom-up approach. So he's tried to identify proper nouns in the text. So at one point, there's um, a, uh, a cluster of stars, um, which looks like the constellation Taurus, mm-hmm. and there's a word next to it, and he's assumed that that is Taurus. Okay. Um, and then he's done the same thing with uh, the names of the plants in the book. Uh, so there are pictures in the book? There are lots of pictures in the yeah, book. Yeah, I've seen that, yeah. Of, uh, yeah. of, of plants, um, and then there's texts supposedly, you would imagine, about the plants. Mm. Um, so he's assumed that the first word on every page mm-hmm. is the name of the plant. Okay. Um, and from that, he's tried to identify what uh, phonetic value the symbols would have, mm-hmm. and then he's tried to figure out some other words based on that. Uh, and he's come up with a list of ten words which he's quite uh, confident about, which are juniper, taurus, coriander, centauria... Chiron, these are all either plant names yeah. or from mythology. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hellebore, Nigella sativa, hmm. uh, Kesar, and Cotton. Hmm. Um, and he thinks some of them are stronger than others. What do you mean stronger than others? Uh, so he thinks some of these words can be more confidently ah. identified oh, than okay. others. Yeah. 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 
Um, oh, we've got the pictures here too. Yeah, I'm looking at some okay. of the pictures. Yeah. Enjoy those, uh, listeners, at home, <laughs> some of the pictures. <laughs> Google it. <laughs> yeah, that's what I did. Um, you, can, you can view the whole uh, Voynich manuscript online for free. Mm-hmm. Um, so do that. You, won't, you probably won't be able to read it, but uh, give it a go. Unless Stephen Bax is listening. Yes, yeah. Um, you can read ten words if you're Stephen Bax. Um, so he's, he's not sure who wrote the, uh, the manuscript. There's um, a surprising amount of nudity in it. Yes. And you're saying this is this was from the 15th century. The 15th century, yeah. right? Okay. The 1400s. 1400s, yeah. Yeah. Um, so he thinks it uh, was probably an invented language. Uh, uh, sorry, an invented script for a language which didn't have a script. Mm-hmm. Um, right. So someone came up with this to uh, try to to express a language that didn't have a script in writing. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then later the culture dispersed or died out or. Something like that, and uh, and the source of the script was lost, mm. and that's why we don't uh, we can't read it, and we don't know what it means. Mm-hmm. Um, and based on similarities in the in the sound of the co- the words that he thinks he's decoded, he says it's probably not European, but more likely to be Near Eastern, Caucasian, or Asian. So mm-hmm. yeah, what do you think? Do you think this is a, a compelling case for having cracked the Voynich manuscript? Sure. Uh, <laughs> not having had a crack at it myself, um, I'm willing to give uh, Mr. Bax the benefit of the doubt, I suppose. Mm. Um, mm, yeah. Don't, I mean, I, yeah, I wouldn't really know how to analyse ancient texts. Mm. I mean, <clears throat> the way he's done it seems to be quite a, a concise way, I guess, making, you know, making comparisons between the images and making... Uh, Educated guesses. That's what he's doing, really. I guess making mm. educated guesses. Yeah. Well, what uh, what he felt was the the strongest connection was when he'd worked out these different um, sounds for various letters, mm-hmm. um, and then he uh, he found a plant which he could identify, mm. um, and then he made a guess of using using those sounds of what the word was, the first word in the in the sentence. Then he googled it and found that actually that word. Is used as a name for the plant in some languages, mainly mm-hmm. in like Middle Eastern yeah. languages. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so he felt that that kind of uh, verified his yeah. his thoughts on it. Yeah. Um, and it comes across as very uh, convincing in the way that he's written it. I did read this whole paper; it took a long time, um, but it, it comes across as quite convincing. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, one interesting thing would be to 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 know like how much of of that language, that the, the, the properties of that language can be gleaned from, from just this one text. I mean, in terms of you mm. know, grammar or... Well, it's 240 pages long, mm-hmm. so that there's plenty of text there mm-hmm. to work with. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, the, of course, it might not even be a real language. It might be something that's, uh, that was just hoax. Mm-hmm. Um, because it, it seems to have a very small alphabet. There's only between 18 and 22 symbols mm-hmm. used. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's... Uh, it's um, yeah, it, it repeats a lot. So a lot of uh, the same symbols keep coming up over and over again, mm-hmm. um, which seems kind of unnatural. But right. then it would also seem strange, as Bax points out, for someone to do a hoax that was so obviously not a real language. Right. Um, right. So he thinks, as I say, that it's a natural language that someone invented a script for. Well, this is from the 1400s, but there was there is documented. You know, there are documents out there with like real language use that doesn't yeah. need to be decoded. Yeah. So because we already know what those are. What the language is, yeah. Yeah. So so the problem here was no one knows which language family this is from. Exactly. Right. And yeah, and, and no could it, could it not be like a kind of a creative piece? Um you mean someone who's just you mean could, a, language, a, piece of, a piece of art, perhaps? Well, it, it could have been. I mean, there, there's been a few different... As, as I said earlier, the, there have been a few different suggestions. One interesting one that, was that it's just a bit of glossolalia. It's like someone speaking in tongues mm-hmm. and just writing down whatever they're, th- whatever they're saying, whatever's coming out of their mouth. Yeah. But if they're doing <clears> that, then um, why would it be full of pictures of herbs and plants well, yeah. and constellations? I think you've answered it. It's strange. Um, there, there has actually, I, in doing research for this... Um, I found that Stephen Bax's theory has been criticised quite heavily mm-hmm. by some other people. Um, so a lot of his assumptions uh, seem to be a little bit weak. Uh, for example, um, he says that the initial words on herbal pages are the names of the herbs, but there's not necessarily a reason to think that's true. Um, uh, he says that three of the different symbols in the 
uh, language are the letter R in different uses. So there's like a, an end word letter R and a middle word letter R and so on. Um, but if there's only 18 to 22 characters and three of them are R, then it's going to be a very limited language. Maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe. maybe somebody mm. smoked herbs and wrote this. <laughs> Yes. I mean, that could be a possibility. That could be could a possibility. Be but I mean, the letter R, is a, that's, a, that's our letter R. Yeah. Um, and so it's, there's no reason to think that another language may have three subtle mm -hmm. different phonemes, which are... Sure, but which then, we would then you've got this R. limited number of, um, of, of symbols to express what, uh, what's being said. Mm -hmm. And if three of them are being taken up by variants of R, then... But in that language, maybe those variants are important. Well, maybe they are. I mean, yeah. who knows? But these are yeah. these are criticisms that yeah, yeah. have been made. Um, another interesting one is that he he uses these pictures of plants and tries to identify the uh, the names of the plants based on uh, what people have said. But um, a lot of uh, people have pointed out that actually you, you you we don't really know what a lot of these plants were, and mm. that he's relying on one person's quite speculative opinion of what these plants were. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So he might be wrong about that. Um, are there any other cases? I mean. I'm I don't know, but are there any other cases of a just one example of a written language? I mean, it seems odd that there wouldn't be any other any other pieces of text using this language. Uh, yeah, no, this is the only example of this particular language. But there are examples of other texts, um, which which Bax talks about in the paper, mm -hmm. um, where uh, someone just invented a text mm -hmm. uh, to try and capture a language. Um, yeah. So he gives one particular example, which I can't remember mm -hmm. the name of. Um, it's a, something gothic. Uh, but yeah, the, there are examples of this happening in the past, which is why Bax thinks this could have happened. But mm -hmm. reading his paper, it seemed very persuasive. Reading sure. the criticisms, it seems a bit shakier. Sure. So I'm not sure where I fall on this, but uh, yeah, it seems at least it's an interesting story at least. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. cultures. Okay, so today for uh, this episode's Tefl Cultures section, uh, I'd like to talk about ER. Um, do you two know what ER stands for? Uh, and I know what you're thinking. <laughs> it's not the one with George Clooney in. Okay, um, then I don't know. Sorry. It's uh, extensive reading, I It believe. is extensive reading, Rob. You're very correct. Yeah. Yes. Very correct. <laughs> very correct. Um, yeah, so today I'd like to talk about extensive reading, a, l a little bit about the history of it and kind of its importance in um, English teaching today. Mm -hmm. um, so, well, just start off with your experiences of it. Have you come across it or used it or implemented it in your lessons? Uh, or outside of your lesson? Yeah. I, I've come across it and I've, I've, I've um, heard people talk about it a lot. Um, and I did, I kind of, I guess, ran a sort of an extensive reading program okay, for right. some uh, junior high school students. Yeah. So it was twice a week, um, their 50-minute lesson. I had a bunch of readers, and they could take a reader and read it and then put it back and take a different one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Rob, how about you? Uh, I've never, I've never implemented it. I've never <clears> taught <throat> extensive reading, but I have, I have heard of it, and I've been to a seminar uh, and learned a bit about it. So yeah, I'm relatively up on what what it is. About. Yeah, I'm, I'm very similar to you. I've never used it myself or had the chance to use it, um, but I know a little bit about it. <laughs> yeah. <I don't> <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully display. Um, <laughs> so, like, yeah, yeah, I mean, ER, like, like Petra Kutcher last time, is a fairly recent movement, I guess, maybe 10... It's kind of been formalised, I guess, in the past sort of 10 to 15 years or so. Mm -hmm. um, but, I mean, its roots stem from the vocabulary movement of mm -hmm. the 1920s, um, where they had books that would focus on, you know, on vocab points. Mm. Um, for example, uh, in bold and letters, they'd have the vocab in bold. That would be the vocab that you'd be studying. Right. And there wouldn't be an emphasis on um, kind of redundant vocabulary or reading for enjoyment. It would be reading for to generate new vocabulary. Mm. Is, is, that's how I understand it. Is that correct? Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So basically, they'd have things like supplemental reading or graded readers, yeah. mm -hmm. basically, where there'd be new vocabulary introduced um, okay. rather than uh, what ER is about now, mm -hmm. which is um, 
reading at 90% of vocabulary awareness. Oh, really? So you're reading... I've heard even higher. Possibly even higher, yeah. 96, 98, yeah, something. Yeah. Basically, yeah. where you're reading at a level where you understand almost everything in the text and yeah. you don't need to use the dictionary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So kind of ERs kind of, yeah, move from this original... Um, vocabulary movement into reading for enjoyment mm -hmm. and reading at a fluent level and speed basically where you don't need um, a dictionary for help or yeah. support yeah. yeah basically and yeah this has kind of become a trend of late i guess to get students to use er outside of class mm. and also like matt said uh, in programs as well and having extensive reading programs mm -hmm. yeah um and so, uh, yes. uh, who are the who are the big names in ER? Big names in ER, Rob. I'm glad you asked. Uh, well, okay. There's been a couple of texts. So, so Bamford and Day have written a number of uh, books about ER. Yeah. I think Jack Richards also wrote uh -huh. an introduction to ER. Of Richards and Robert Rogers fame. Yep. Yeah. Those two. Yeah. And obviously, there's the ER Foundation, which are a large organisation dealing mm -hmm. in, in ER, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so I the think, uh, Krashen was a speaker at the first ER conference. Right, okay. National mm. ER conference. So yes. I guess he yeah, has some a lot of Krashen's ideas like acquisition. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I read an article yesterday actually, um, it was called uh, Krashen, a victim of history. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was quite good. Right. Yeah. Sorry, it's a, a side <laughs> issue. Why, why is he a victim of history, Bob? Um, no, just because his, uh, a lot of people sort of discount his theories. He's a kind of a, you know, a sort of a vilified figure yeah, in, yeah. in the field. Um, mm -hmm. And they, this person was saying a bit unfairly. <laughs> um, right. But yeah, his, his theories fell out of fashion because he was at the top. He fell a long way. I didn't, I didn't attend the, the ER conference, um, which I think was in Nagoya. Last year or two years ago? I think right, they do it every right. two years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but what I, people I know attended, and, and one of the points he brought, or one of his main kind of things was, so he, he's, he always talks about comprehensible input. Mm. Yeah, yeah. But he, he, I think he wants to revise that into compelling input. Okay, mm. right, yeah. Um, and maybe, maybe he well, said that for yeah. a VR conference. What would compelling input Well, that's, be? That, I mean, I guess with VR, I mean, like we were going about reading for enjoyment. Mm. So... The students are reading, and their intrinsic motivation is being developed. They're reading, you know, it's kind of, some people make this argument that ER kind of promotes the image of English. Mm. Students are reading more um, English texts, they're read, or they're listening, EL, extensive listening, they're listening mm. to news, movies, yeah. and they're kind of, the, more of the culture of English is being mm. improved through ER. That's kind of one of the big arguments. Yeah. yeah. Uh, also motivation. And obviously well. contrasting it with IR, intensive reading. Right, yeah. Which yeah. is what usually happens in high schools. Mm. Yeah. And that is looking at a text where they don't know most of the words. Right. And they right. go through with the teacher, with their classmates. Yeah, and, yeah. And it's probably not that enjoyable. Right, And yeah, the meaning is, yeah, I mean, often I think they don't get much meaning out of it. And they're usually graded readers. For ER. For yeah. Uh, intensive reading. Oh, well, well, well. well, both, but yeah. Yeah. But I think... Intensive reading, probably somewhere in like the, I don't know, 70 to 90 percent, or probably more than that. Mm. Mm. Um, but intensive reading, you, you would spend a lot of time, you know, analyzing the text for vocabulary, yeah, for grammar, yeah. for those kind of things. Yeah. And so, ER, you shouldn't, hopefully you shouldn't be doing those kind of things. So like, yeah, people have talked about how to handle ER. Should, should ER, um, so basically people have come down to the point that ER shouldn't replace what's currently happening in mm -hmm. the class. Yeah. It should run kind of parallel to it or perhaps shouldn't even be brought into class. It should be for the students to do at home. Mm. It should be a requirement of the course, mm -hmm. but, but something that they can't opt out of. If you give students the choice, they probably right. won't read. So this right. is, for me, this is the big kind of dichotomy, if that's the right word, for mm. about ER is that it, there, it, people, always, people who push ER always kind of reach a point where they have to compromise a little bit. Mm. Yeah. Where it's it should you know the students should choose what they want to read. If they don't enjoy it, they should put it down and pick up something else. Mm. They should read in their own time. They should enjoy it. Mm. But it becomes compulsory, and that those those two and things that's, don't. That's where the enjoyment drops off. Yeah. Perhaps, yeah. yeah. Exactly. So they've talked yeah. about ways. You know, there does need to be some sort of assessment in some context. So how do you go about doing that? Yeah. Um, is it a case of just so a lot of new websites, uh, ER websites? So they're trying mm -hmm. to move 
into e-reading, which is arguably more mm -hmm. motivating as well, reading on iPhones, mm -hmm. iPads. Yeah. And they they kind of have these random question generators, so they're not answering the same questions every time, so that mm. each student has different uh, yeah. possible answers. Mm. Um, so that's one way to kind of make sure that the students are doing the work that you mm -hmm. said, I yeah. guess. See, I, like for me again, this it all all these kind of yeah. things turn it into language learning it. Uh, yeah, exercises, yeah, yeah. which again is not meant to be the point, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah, you know, but then then people don't do that. ER. Yeah, exactly. People so, have talked a lot yeah. about why ER programs fail at universities. Mm -hmm. I've heard of a, a couple of cases where they've set up, you know, they've they've got a room and they've it's made the library and they've done all this yeah. stuff, yeah, um, and then they have to close it within no a couple of years it. because yeah. people just stop using it or not yeah. enough people use it. Yeah. Well, have either of you ever actually done any extensive reading yourself in a foreign language? No, I, I know you do in Japanese, I guess you do. Yeah, it's the extent. only language I know <laughs> apart from English. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've tried it, yeah. And that's quite a new thing, actually. Actually, uh, L1, like Japanese graded readers and mm. ER, that's kind of a new thing as well. Yeah. So I've, I've found it very, very helpful to do reading um, at, at about my level um, because... My, my vocabulary isn't very high in Japanese. I think that's a problem with a lot of Japanese learners. Uh, it's quite difficult to remember the vocabulary. Um, and reading uh, these kind of the graded readers, um, it helped me in passing very long sentences, picking up new grammar. And then because they're graded at different levels, you can move up through the levels um, until yeah. you get to a, a higher level of reading proficiency. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I, I found it very, very useful. I've never tried it with students, but from my own personal yeah. experiments, I, I thought mm. it was uh, I mean, a good just, way to yeah. learn. Just I, going back to Matt's point as well, yeah, maybe the reason that um, ER fails is students get the wrong level, the teachers don't know how to mm. set the correct levels, so mm, they yeah. obviously the, their motivation drops off. Yeah. Um, yeah, obviously when you make it assessed. You know. yep. um, yeah. One way around that is to maybe do reading circles so mm -hmm. they can cooperate and all talk about it yeah. in that kind of communicative way. Yeah. Um, also, should the teacher choose the text or not, or should it be the students choosing the text? That's another... I guess yeah. that would depend. Pure, pure ER, the students pure should, ER, yeah. should choose it. But, yeah. Yeah. but that depends on the, uh, on the, the role of ER in the class, because obviously if you're doing some kind of assessment, you can't just have the students all choosing different books. Oh, you could still. Well, well yeah. How how can you do that? <laughs> well, I mean, it depends on the type, depends on like how. Yeah, it depends on the assessment, obviously. But um, if the students write something about it, or if they prepare to, it works well with you know um, mixed skills. Yeah. So they could read it and then they write about it and they tell somebody else about it, and all those things can be assessed. Yeah. Just just to briefly bring a little bit of research, uh, one of the things that um, stops people from taking on ER is the, yeah, like you say, the price, the room, the mm -hmm. library. Uh, but <clears throat> I think, do you, you know Rob Waring? Rob yep. Waring, yeah. I'm not sure if this is his study, but a study that he references. He talks about um, Japanese students, when they leave high school, only have around about 35,000 words mm -hmm. from their course books yeah. in mm -hmm. terms of exposure. 35,000? Vocabulary, yeah. You mean 3,500? 35,000. Really? Right. Yeah. That they've been exposed to. That they've been exposed to. That's not unique amount. words. So. Not unique words. No, things right. that they've been exposed to. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. Sheer, <laughs> sheer, <laughs> I was going to say, sorry, sheer quantity. Yeah. Sheer, sheer quantity of words, maybe repeated words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, yeah, basically what he was saying, compared to Mexico and Korea, that's far less, yeah. obviously. Yeah. And obviously with Mexico, you'd understand. But um, by adding ER... Um, that increased mm -hmm. their kind of exposure to 219,000. Yeah. So exactly. there's a considerable amount more yeah. there. So obviously mm -hmm. that has um, offshoots on their, I guess, their fluency mm -hmm. and their complexity, yeah. I guess. So do you think this is something you're going to do in the future? Um, if I had the chance, yeah. But again, that's what it comes down to, I guess, institutional restrictions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. okay, let's wrap that up. Okay. TEFL Pioneers. Okay, this week's TEFL Pioneer is Henry Sweet. Do you guys know Henry Sweet? Yes, a little bit. In passing. Okay, he, yeah, he's probably best <laughs> Not known... Not on a first name basis. <laughs> <laughs> he's probably best known as the inspiration, or one of the inspirations for uh, Professor Henry Higgins from Pygmalion. Mm. So he was um, known by Bernard Shaw. I think they may have even been friends. Oh. Um, 
And Bernard Shaw, in the preface to Pygmalion, um, refers to Henry Higgins as a professor of phonetics, which is obviously a very direct reference to Henry Sweet. Henry Sweet was a philologist. Mm. Yes. And a phonologist and a phonetician. But not a phrenologist. But not a phrenologist. That's yeah. one area he didn't explore. <laughs> um, he was born in London in 1845, and he died in Oxford in 1912. Um, he was, mm, he was, I guess, maybe most famous for creating the broad Romic um, writing system, which was adapted from a system that Ellis, not Rod Ellis, a different <laughs> Ellis, probably no relation, mm. um, created for uh, transcribing uh, sounds, phonemes oh, of okay, spoken languages. Yeah. Um, and Shaw probably improved on that system. And that was the maybe the direct ancestor of the IPA. Oh, I see. Interesting. Because right. mm -hmm. this was this was a big thing in in this time period, wasn't it? Uh, they were trying to make language study kind of more scientific, and the study of phonetics was uh, it, it it made it seem more concrete, more scientific than it, the kind of artsy way it was treated before. Right. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean, Sweet's big kind of his main thing was was first of all um, looking at. A living language, studying the language as it is spoken now, mm. rather than looking at it historically. Yeah, philology was traditionally considered the study of languages through um, old scripts of the language, mm. um, but he thought it was much more uh, useful and meaningful to study the the language as it's spoken. And so mm. he put a right. big emphasis on spoken language and the sounds of the language. So therefore, like connected speech and things like. Or was this before even that idea? Uh, no, no, no. He yeah. Prosody, I think, was, Prosody, right. was one of his Prosody. things. Prosody. 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 I don't know how you pronounce uh, yeah. it. Yeah. Prosody. If you put it into a sentence, it's easier. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, um, but that, that was kind of a, an innovation of his, was to, was to treat the, the living language and the sounds of the ling living language as the basis for studying languages in general and for learning English as a second language. Mm. Right. So how does what he uh, learned back then and what he studied back then, how does that filter down to today? Oh. That's a good question. Um, he wrote a book, he wrote several books. Um, most of his most maybe prominent work was on strictly on phonetics. Mm -hmm. um, but he wrote books on how to learn Icelandic and, and various things. Right. And he wrote a book that I'm holding here called The Practical Study of Languages. Mm. Is that a first edition? It is not, no. no. <laughs> um, this is a, a later OUP edition. Mm. Um, it was originally written in the late 19th century. Yeah. And then, the, I guess, the main publication was in 1900. Mm. Um, and, yeah, it's basically, as it, just as the title indicates, um, what he thinks is the practical way to study languages. His emphasis is very much on, on the sounds, on the phonology. Mm. Um, he, he thinks that's the starting point. If you want to learn any right. language, that's the starting point, right. is first to figure out how to produce the sounds of mm. the language. So, I mean, obviously the IPA has certain symbols to replicate mm -hmm. those sounds. Did, yeah. did he, what did he use at that, at that time? Um, he, I mean, he came up, he, based on this previous version by this guy called Ellis, um, he adapted that and he identified more sounds. He was one of these people, he could produce the sounds. Mm. Um, so what Ellis did was he made... Basically, the way he charted it was by, you know, the mouth position, mm. the tongue and, and everything. Yeah. And, and Shaw, uh, not Shaw, um, Sweet, <laughs> <laughs> um, adapted that. He, the IPA is a, is a much reduced version oh, really? of what Sweet created. Oh, right, so there was more. Yeah, oh, Sweet, he, I think he had, he identified 36 vowel sounds. Mm. Right. And then later on, he realized, I, can't, I don't know the, the, the technical side of it, but he realized that each of those vowel sounds actually had two. So... Right, seventy-two vowel sounds, and he mm. could he could he claimed, and I, there was nobody around to test him, I guess, really. But he claimed he could produce each of those sounds, and he could distinguish right. each of those vowel sounds. Um, but if he's the only one who can do it, then that would be quite easy. He could just go, eh, "That is uh, that is this one." Yes, exactly, <laughs> so, exactly. Yeah. At, at, at this time, were, were they using terms like diphthongs and fricatives? That's a good question. Or is that I more of a reduce? So. Is this part of the IPA? The is it more, more yeah. se separated? Reductive. The mm. Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure. I imagine that those, maybe not, um, because he, he really revolutionized and right, popularized okay. within applied yeah. linguistics um, mm. the study of phonetics. Um, so maybe not, yeah. Yeah. Um, so when I read about him uh, mm -hmm. in, uh, in uh, 
Howard's book, uh, History of English Language Teaching, mm -hmm. um, he had uh, some disappointments in his life. Yes, yeah. So he was, um, he, yeah, he, he was originally sent to be a, a lawyer um, by his father, but he, he was one of these people, um, he would get very obsessed with whatever he was interested in. Um, and so he knew he was interested in languages. Mm. Um, he convinced his father that if he went to Oxford, he'd be able to get a job in academia. Mm -hmm. So his father agreed to it. Um, there was nothing, there was no course that he could study in his area of interest, so he studied classical literature. Right. Um, but was a terrible student because he spent all of his time transcribing things and, and mm -hmm. basically working on his own stuff. Yeah. Um, but he stayed in academia, he stayed in Oxford. Um, he was, yeah, he, he was very short-sighted. Mm. Uh, and Made very rash decisions. <laughs> <laughs> physically short-sighted. He couldn't see things that were far but away. He had a good ear for Th things. But he had, a, he had an incredibly good ear. Um, short-sighted but long-eared. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we'll do. Um, Long-winded. And, <laughs> and, but maybe, his, maybe it was a slightly obsessive nature, but he often alienated people. I think it was a, it was a combination, it seemed like, of his obsessive nature and his command of language, mm. that when he wanted to um, put people off or be somewhat rude, mm. he could be incredibly rude. And right. so he made a lot of enemies. It was like the Dr. House of Tefl. Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so when there was a, a seat... George Clooney is the, the, <laughs> the ER of ER? Uh, what? what? No, Hugh Laurie, I think we're, Hugh Laurie. we're on to Hugh Laurie. On yeah. another hospital. Oh, right, yeah. It's right. Like hospital related. <laughs> <laughs> Joke. Um, yeah. yeah, so th there was a. There was a he, he had this dream of. Yeah, I mean, a, a bit of the background is that um, at that time, Germany and German philologists were very much at the vanguard of, of applied linguistic studies. Mm. And England at that time was not. So what he did was he studied the German or what the German grammarians were doing at that time, and wanted to establish a similar school in England, in Oxford. Right. Um, but he was passed over for a position in Oxford that he thought would have given him the platform to start this, oh, this okay. school, this, this new school mm -hmm. of, of philology or, or applied linguistics, yeah. or what have you. Um, and so never quite um, achieved what he wanted to. He, he did write a lot of books um, mm -hmm. and did achieve some um, recognition for his work. Yeah. Um, and the, have I talked about this? A little bit, yeah. All right. Um, the, 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 the book he wrote about the study of languages, um, what, for me was interesting was he, some of the, the ideas he has about studying languages seem to be more kind of modern or more progressive than probably a lot of the language teaching that still goes on today. Right. Um, in, in what sense, for example? For example, um, talking about phonetics or phonology, um, he talks about the fallacy of imitation. So mm -hmm. the first fallacy is that pronunciation can be learnt by mere imitation. Okay. Which um, we're all familiar with teachers getting their students to repeat the same yeah. word over and over again or the same sounds over and over again, hoping My that the students will eventually be able to produce it correctly. My um, teacher does that. Right, <laughs> right. Um, but we know that's, that's perhaps not true. Um, talking about uh, grammar, teaching of grammar. Um, yeah, I mean, he's... Maybe, maybe part of the background is that he was very much against grammar translation as a mm. method of, of language learning. Right. Um, like I say, he wanted to, he thought it was important to start from the sounds of the language and work up from there. It must have been how he was studying if he was a student of, uh, of classics, classical literature, is what you said. You mean grammar translation? Or? Yeah, yeah, when he was studying as, a, as an undergraduate. Mm, yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure he did that. But he, like I say, he was much more interested in, in, in learning mm. living languages. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so he, he talks about, when he talks about grammar, he says the first thing to remember is that, um, is in terms of grammar, is the antithesis between form and meaning. Right. So he thought it was very important to, I think maybe back then people, you know, thought that the two were so closely linked. Yeah, idiots. <laughs> um, so, yeah. I see. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so... Do you think uh, he has had a big impact on, on how things are done still? Do you think his, his work lives on? Um, I think it does, certainly, um, in terms of, I mean, I think, I don't know, I, I like the way that Adrian Underhill approaches um, pronunciation training. Yeah. Um, and for me, it's, you know, he, he, he 
certainly stays away from imitation. Mm. Um, and I think, I mean, I remember my phonology professor um, talked about, you know, if you're, if you're studying phonology, you have to be able to cr- produce these sounds and mm. know exactly what, where the mouth position and the tongue right, position right. is. I think that all that comes from, from sweet. Okay, interesting. So he has had actually a, quite a big impact. That's things that we study on our, uh, our diplomas. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah, being able to un, uh, describe the manner of the manner of articulation, mm, yeah, for example, yeah, 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 place yeah, of articulation, kind of using the what's it called, the sagittal diagram. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, yeah, the, 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 the map of the yeah, 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 yeah. it's called the sagittal. I'm not sure, but mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. Whenever I draw that on the board, it just looks awful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, Um But I think I mean it, it took a while, but I think he was part of the movement, and his his literature was out there um, for people to eventually move away from grammar translation right, right. and focus much more on the spoken language than the written, yeah. the written language. Mm. Yeah, oh, interesting. Mm-hmm. Good on you, Henry Sweet. Yeah, thank you, Henry Sweet. <laughs> and that's our TEFL pioneer for today. Okay, so thank you very much for listening to today's episode of TEFLology. Um, if you have enjoyed this episode, uh, do drop us an email. Our, yeah. <laughs> our email address is in the uh, is in the description uh, somewhere around this podcast. Yep, below it, I think. Below, yeah. next to whatever. Yeah, and um, stay tuned for more. There will be another episode. Um, so yeah, thanks for coming. Okay. Bye. Bye. <laughs>